Hi, this is Rob Johnson. I'm the president of the Institute for New Economic Thinking. And thank you for joining us here for INET Live. Today, we're here to talk about what we call the paralysis from above. The COP26 meetings and beyond, and particularly with a focus on the future of the developing countries. I'm very concerned myself as I read about COP26, where several hundred energy lobbyists are allowed to attend and some of the ministers from the Global South were not allowed. I'm very concerned, though I have faith that the science and technology is there, that we will not be able to realize that unless we have a new vision of the common good and the systems of governance that are there to, uh, which you might call facilitated. I did a podcast with a Republican from the Bush administration the other day named Glenn Harbert. He's writing a new book. It's called Walls and Bridges. And how if we continue to allow this plutocratic overwhelming of governance, and if we stifle international collaboration that's necessary, in his view, things will degenerate. And the question metaphorically is, how do we build that bridge over troubled waters that Simon and Garfunkel once spoke of? Today, I have with me three people who are extraordinarily aware and attentive. I've had the good fortune of making a podcast with each of them before. Richard Kozel Wright, who is the director of UNCTAD's Globalization and Development Strategies. He's a, an economist. PhD in economics from University of Cambridge and has, I believe, attended some of the COP26 meetings in Glasgow, is my understanding. Maud Barlow, if you were an economist, you would call her a liquid asset. She's a water warrior, author, political activist, a dynamo. She's written wonderful books about what's not happened or what needs to happen with respect to water but she's uh, working on, how would I say, ways to let us see that the sun is rising rather than heading over the horizon. Patrick Bond, who I recently made a podcast with, he's from the University of Johannesburg, Department of Sociology, and he's done all kinds of work. He's based in South Africa. He's done all kinds of work on the fossil fuel industry, stranded assets, north-south issues, the political economy of what you might call obstacles to the kind of transformation that our global society will need to survive. I want to thank you all for being here. I guess I'll give you a couple of bullet point questions to frame things. What is causing the paralysis? How do we get green energy finance in the developing countries? How do we develop the global south without the use of fossil fuels? And uh, a number of other questions. How does climate change endanger the clean water that, Maud, you have been uh, advocating or warning us is at risk? And uh, how can economics and how can society respond? We'll uh, begin the process today. I guess uh, with some speeches or some opening statements, I should say, of eight to 10 minutes, beginning with Richard, then Patrick and Maud, and then we'll have time for a discussion with Q and A, uh, or first a discussion among the panelists, and then Q and A with the audience. I would alert those in the audience that we do have a, uh, Q&A panel, you can submit your questions on the chat and uh, then we will uh, we will address them there in the last phase. But I wanna thank all the panelists for joining me. I uh, also was very inspired by George Mombio's recent writings at The Guardian and I wanna pay tribute to him, to Naomi Klein and her brother Seth and other people that I continue to learn from. 
At any rate, Richard, why don't you begin and, uh, and let us know what you think happened, what you think didn't happen, what you think needs to happen. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Rob, for that. I, ha I mean, I, I was at the COP, at the second week of the COP. I have to say it was the first time I had been to a COP. So this was a novel experience for me, even though I followed it uh, from a distance. Um, and still trying to weigh up the details of what happened. That may be a fool's game, I think, in a way. It seems to me that, that you know, much like Kurosawa's film Rashomon, uh, different people have very different interpretations depending on uh, how they were looking at the at the, pro at the process. Um, but so, I mean, I guess there's a there was a kind of loose consensus that between the between the breakdown of Copenhagen and the euphoria of Paris, this seem people seem to think this was the the, the best possible outcome under the circumstances. But the problem is that the circumstances are not very good, and they've they've become significantly worse under over the last decade, as as you know, climate scientists have become much more attuned to the kinds of problems that that we face from pumping more and more carbon into in into the atmosphere, and more alarmist about the lack of action in response to what they have known. And I guess the IPCC report that came out uh, over the summer before uh, the, 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 co the conference, many people hoped would be a real wake up call. And, and I guess it, it wasn't really from my point of view. I mean, I was surprised about about um, the lack of uh, 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 um, progress that was made during the conference, um, and I, I, I would, I, I think I would, I mean, there's a certain context I think for that that goes beyond the the climate crisis it's, itself, and you got to put that into some sort of uh, context. Um, and one of those, of course, is the failure to make a significant um, policy correction after the global financial crisis. We all expected to see some significant changes in terms of policy and politics after the global financial crisis and it and it it didn't it it, it didn't really happen um uh and as a, partly as a consequence of that we've had a decade in which political and economic divisions have been growing and trust in governments and government governmental processes has been has been uh, diminishing uh, significantly, and and I think the COVID crisis, which has opened up some important new avenues uh, of thinking, has has added a layer of ambiguity. We don't really know where we're going as a consequence of the of of the COVID crisis and the reaction of governments to that. Some of which has been very positive, some of which have been quite alarming in terms of in terms of uh, of the response. Um, you know, and, and so framing in uh, against that backdrop, framing the the meeting in Glasgow as the kind of last best hope for the planet was kind of setting up the conference. I think, which is how it was described by the host. I think was setting up the conference for for a certain amount of of failure. And and in practice, as far as at least my interpretation is that most of the outcome was essentially kicking down kicking the can down the road to Egypt. Uh, uh, next year, um, and there are two kind of big worries that uh, two two big issues that make me worried about uh, what will happen in 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 Egypt uh, next year from from the kind of perspective that we have and uh, 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 here in Unctad. Um and the first kind of issue that I mean shocked me to a little bit is just how little the climate challenge is understood as a development challenge. Um, and a development challenge understood as a transformative problem, not a technocratic problem. And I, I just find it quite shocking that, that the development dimension of the climate challenge is, is, is largely uh, absent. And I think the other big issue that, again, has been apparent to us for some time is the erosion of multilateralism, is the framing of the collective uh, uh, the kind of framing of collective a uh, action in the context of the interdependent world that we that, that we currently uh, live in. Um, 
And I think while advanced economies were desperate to kind of find villains in the story in China and Russia and India, when you think of it in these, when you pose it in the context of these two uh, big issues, um, you know, it's the advanced economies that uh, I think um, we need to turn the spotlight on in understanding the current situation, uh, their attitudes and their actions uh, as, as the countries that are most responsible for the climate problem itself. And I think there were, th there were three things that struck me, and, and I'll, I'll kind of leave it here, that kind of shocked me in a way, in terms of the way, uh, the nature of the discussion uh, in Glasgow uh, that follow from turning the spotlight on the advanced economies. The first one is the way in which they're desperately trying to dilute the notion of common but differentiated responsibility, which is the way in which um, uh, the, the, the collective... Uh, the response, the collective response to the climate challenge should be framed. They, they, they want to talk about shared responsibility, not common but differentiated responsibilities. Um, the second one, the second one uh, issue I think there is their unwillingness to take regulatory action against uh, corporate interests, which are the both the main, the, the principal actors behind carbon emissions. Um, and, the, and, of course, the principal beneficiaries from that carbon-led uh, uh, growth uh, 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 regime. And, and a, a consequence, I think, of those two things, the third point, is this kind of resort to magical thinking that we hear, a kind of neoliberal variant of magical thinking in which um, getting prices right, discovering the, ne the, 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 the new technology that will remove carbon from the atmosphere and putting our faith in big finance is, is, the, is the kind of way in which we think about meeting this challenge. And, and, and we got a sense of that in the day on financing the climate challenge when, when as you know, Rob, you know, large asset managers and, and, and banks said they've got $130 trillion in store to deal with the problem. And of course, politicians were delighted with that kind of talk because it seemed to let them off the hook around the big issue that developing countries in particular worry about, which is mobilizing the resources to deal with the, the climate challenge. And of course, you know, there isn't $130 trillion uh, in, 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 uh, in, these, in these institutions to somehow magically deal with the, the climate crisis. So, so, you know, I was, yeah, I mean, I was looking, looking at it from my perspective, a kind of more development perspective, I, I was not encouraged by the way in which the, uh, the, the discourse was framed or ultimately the, the kind of outcomes that were achieved. Well, thank you, Richard. Uh, I, a dear friend of mine who works in the public relations realm said to me that when he finished this, what, he was in Glasgow, and he said, I just sing this old rhythm and blues song. What you see is what you get. And then he said, uh, and it's, this is 26 cops, he said. It wasn't 26 cops, it was cops and robbers. And he was very, very frustrated that we weren't going to where we had to go. And I know a number of writers have said, why are we not talking about leaving fossil fuel in the ground? Why are we even flirting with compensating or subsidizing these stranded assets? Patrick, I, you know I think a great deal about quickly, your... in, you know, sure. we should be talking, we should be much more worried about state capture than we are about carbon capture when it comes yes. to addressing this problem. Because in a world where many of the advanced economy states are captured, it's very yes. different to get a constructive form of multilateralism to deal with these kinds of problems. I mean, that's a, that's a real, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of mercantilist world that emerges out of that. And we're not going to solve mm -hmm. the climate crisis in a mercantilist world. That's, that's quite clear to me. That's right. Patrick, uh... You're very sensitive to all of these realms. You've shared with me all kinds of different perspectives. I don't want to get in the way. What are you thinking? 
Well, I'm going to just pick up where Richard left off. I, I've known Richard a little bit, and the best of multilateralism, I think, is in his UNCTAD unit that, for example, put the arguments for a global green deal together. And the despair that I hear in Richard and the way you framed it, Rob, and the sort of paralysis from above does suggest uh, that Greta Thunberg was not exaggerating in saying this is blah, 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 right? And her objective is to fire up the base to get the youth ready because it's future generations on and on that have to intensify these battles. But let me take uh, just a step back to say on about six uh, levels, I think this paralysis above, if I'm allowed to just drill down from, from where Richard has left off, really does um, compel us at the base. And especially I'm in Johannesburg, the most unequal city in the world with the most extreme contradictions in excessive use. And we got a special $8.5 billion climate financing deal that under more scrutiny really does fall apart because instead of um, decarbonization and moving from coal, the head of the agency getting that is intending to move from coal to methane, uh, which will amplify many of these problems and lock in a, a great deal of, uh, of unburnable uh, and stranded assets on. Uh, we're having a big fight at the moment here over Shell trying to explore for methane offshore. The six points, the failure to cut emissions uh, sufficiently and fairly and to do so, for example, bringing in the number one polluter in the world is the Pentagon, bringing in military, bringing in maritime, bringing in uh, air. Now, these are uh, problems with Paris. And um, I think we're at 2.7 in these pledges, but these pledges are voluntary without binding uh, systems, accountability mechanisms, punishments of a, if a Donald Trump walks out. Second, to transition gracefully to make sure that the, the working class, poor and working people and communities and the workers in carbon intensive industries, that's energy, it's transport, it's, it's agriculture, construction and, and urbanization processes, it's uh, production systems, it's uh, consumption and disposal. All of these areas that we have to radically transform have, have workers and communities that will be hurt. And we haven't yet heard from the elites any real indication of, of ways to deal with it, which then prevents us from having a good coalition of forces to, to solve the problem. Third, to, to, to bring in all of the other um, sites where the injustices of climate are, are explicit for racial justice, north-south justice, the indigenous people who've been such inspiring leaders on so many fronts, youth communities, uh, and to get formal rights for nature, right? Uh, Maud is the guru of this, for climate migrants and refugees, for, for future generations to, to really install um, core values in a global multilateral uh, system of power that can enforce those rights. And then uh, fourth, to get the technology into global public good form. So we've, instead of, uh, as with this week in the WTO, which was meant to, to look at the, uh, let, me, let me call it apartheid vaccine system in which intellectual property held by big pharma corps, massively subsidized by Global North, has prevented us from, in, in most of this continent, getting above about 7% vaccination rates, hence the conditions for an Omicron uh, variant with all the mutations. These are the sorts of things that really reflect on the utter failure, the moral failure, the political failure of these elites. And the same is true for transferring technology that would be very important for uh, for climate, for solar, for for um, wind power and all manner of other technologies. And instead, what as um, uh, Richard was hinting at, the fantasy world includes the false solutions of all sorts of, um, let me call them sort of biotech and uh, artificial intelligence and um, you know the genetic modified approaches to uh, trying to sequester in ways that are entirely unproven and, and, and very difficult or to add nuclear back in. And also when we have green economies to address the, the extractivist economy. Uh, a fifth point is to leave the fossil fuels underground, really declare these unburnable assets, make the financial managers, the, the lenders, the investors take that haircut as well. Uh, Rob, I'm going to defer to you because, you know, that's that's where weakening that extraordinary arrogance of a Mark Carney, for example, saying, I've got 130 trillion. They just want profits, right? And they're not ready to, to take this kind of hit when they shouldn't have been making these these investments in the first place. And, and finally, six to be most important, probably for our discussion, what would be the fair financing? We know that the, um, let me call it privatization of the air, the, the selling of the right to pollute through carbon markets, you know, originally from Los Angeles uh, in, in sulfur markets in the early 90s under George W. Bush, uh, H. W. Bush. These haven't worked. I mean, we've now seen the EU push up the carbon price in a manner that 
looks impressive. It's at about $90 per ton price. You can go and buy the right to pollute there. But actually most of the world that's under about 22% carbon pricing is way low. In this country, 42 cents per ton. What should it be? Well, Donald Trump said $1 per ton. Joe Biden says $51. The IMF, when it calculates the implicit subsidies, right, the 5.9 trillion, they're a little better, $60 a ton. Europe about 90. But the new research says really the damage being done, the planetary threat, puts this carbon price, the social cost of carbon at $3,000 a ton, which in turn means these markets aren't working and they're financial speculative in character. They always crash when the, when the financial bubbles crash. But it means a carbon um, uh, overload and overdose by many of us, me in the global north in Johannesburg, but we need to acknowledge a climate debt, exactly what Richard said, the, the special responsibilities, the polluter pays principle, a very simple principle that helps to correct neoliberal economics to internalize exter externalities. To me, that's where the um, better uh, inside negotiators were trying to put loss and damage back. Of course, it's loss and damage because of the massive hits, especially that the global south has because it's not insured, about 4% insured compared to the North, 60%. But as a last point, we, we need to bring in climate debt in other ways. And really it's going to be not just the loss and damage paying for what the North has done, but also it's going to be the adaptation costs and making these, these sites, African rural areas or, or cities more resilient. So that is going to be very heavy infrastructure, but job creating infrastructure. But it's also the compensation for the unused carbon space, the, um, our ability to be able to industrialize in Africa, limited now by the excesses and compensating there. So compensating Africa to leave fossil fuels underground is one step in that direction. If you don't trust African governments, which most of our civil society activists would say, yeah, we don't trust even the South African government to distribute um, the, the funds for a climate debt payment properly. Well, we need basic income grants. We need to find ways to um, basically incentivize um, countries. Ecuador started this with the Yasuni project, but we have plenty of examples here. And even that climate finance project was, was part of this story. Incentivize countries to leave fossil fuels underground, give them some concessions so that the revenues, revenue streams, hopefully they do get down to the people. If not, we can set up basic income grant mechanisms. There's a good one in Namibia. To me, these are the sort of six ways I would judge. There has been a bit more rhetoric in the COP about indigenous people, gender, um, uh, youth. But really, the, the, the money is where we can really tell whether the global elites are serious. They put $10 trillion into quantitative easing techniques last year. They can't find 100 billion a year. Oxfam says we're only getting 18 billion a year in grant equivalent from that uh, promise. So I would sum up and say, look, this is really a conference of polluters. And when Greta Thunberg says, blah, 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 when our African groups, Pan-African Climate Justice Alliance, and many of our you know, lead intellectuals and activists uh, say the, the, the conference of polluters when it comes to uh, Egypt will follow exactly Boris Johnson's exclusionary strategy because it's a dictatorship, the LCC regime. And what we really need to do now is redouble our efforts to leave our fossil fuels underground to have a blockade, as Naomi Klein puts it, and really to make sure that if things like climate sanctions come up with a carbon border adjustment mechanism, then we begin to really put pressure to make sure there's justice in that. Those would be some of the ways I would conclude with Richard that this was a terrible failure and further delegitimizes a multilateralism led by neoliberals and uh, the fossil fuel industry and, and big corporates. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, we'll come back to you in, in a few minutes when uh, we have the panel interaction. But I'd like to let Maud uh, speak. Maud, uh, I think there are many dimensions. One, just you're an observer of the political economy and the common good. Your focus has been on water. Water may be at greater risk in light of the issues related to fossil fuels. I, I, want, I just want to give you the whiteboard and ask you, what are you seeing? What worries you? And what would you like to see? All right. Well, first of all, Rob, thank you very much for inviting me on this panel to be with my dear old friend, Patrick. It's just so lovely to see you. Why did we leave all those years? And to meet my new friend, Richard, this is just terrific. 
Um, <clears throat> I come to you from the uh, unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe here in Ottawa, Canada. Um, water was not on the table uh, officially at COP26. It never is. There is usually a UNESCO uh, event that happens that talks about it. I spoke at the one in Paris and uh, someone who works with me was in the audience and, and as I spoke, she heard people say, hearing saying, socialist, socialist. <laughs> it was quite funny. Um, so, uh, but water, water is generally seen as a subset. When people talk about climate, they're talking about carbon emissions and then they see water as being impacted by that, which of course is true. Uh, with melting glaciers and with the warming of the atmosphere is the warming of the waters, which means they evaporate more quickly. Thirsty forests, thirsty uh, farms uh, need more water. Uh, we know that. But it, it, as, as much as that is true, the way we are polluting, diverting, damming, uh, mismanaging the world's water uh, uh, is is one of the major causes of cl the climate crisis and watershed protection and restoration is one of the major solutions to it and, and so this has been a long-standing uh, position of mine um, so that, that, so that you, you just simply can't uh, uh, disconnect them um, but it's very much water is very much impacted by something that's coming out of both COP not officially so far, but out of the many discussions around biodiversity, and it's called nature-based solutions. At first blush, it's very exciting, and lots of people are talking about it in a very positive way. It's the recognition that while we are dealing with the carbon crisis and, and getting those greenhouse gas emissions down to zero, um, we have to protect and re restore those uh, air, other areas of nature that, that are going to help us with both carbon sinks and just the, the, the local hydrologic cycle. So protection and restoration of, of uh, watersheds, wetlands, forests, and soil, and the whole move to regenerative farming and how much that is understood to be part of the solution. Um, and the whole concept of 30 by 30 by, by 2030, that 30% of of the world will be will have biodiversity absolutely protected and the oceans off off the the coast of, of countries will be will be protected and this is key to fighting uh, 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 climate change the climate crisis however the I, I fear that the um, nature-based solutions has been absconded with as often happens um, by corporate interests uh, and moving move away because we're not talking about the concept of capitalism. We're not talking about the structure of economic globalization with its free trade agreements and with its privatization and its deregulation and a continued faith and, and insistence that the market makes the, the decisions. I mean, I will remind us that of the 100 largest economies in the world, 69 are still transnational corporations and 31 are countries. So we are still very much boxed into that. And if I have a critique of some of the young climate activists, and I love them and work with them, it is that a lot of them just don't, they don't know that part of it because they weren't there for the struggles against uh, economic globalization and, and, the, and, the, and you know, the market deciding everything. Um, and biodiversity is being reinvented basically as a, as a mar market model. In other words, a nature, nature is now called natural asset. Um, ecosystems are ecosystem services, so you can actually put a dollar figure on what that lake is giving to the, the economy or what that forest is. And of course, the huge clear problem with that is if something comes along and can make more money from cutting, shutting down that, cutting down that forest, well, if you brought it into the market economy, that's where it's going to have to compete. The whole concept of biodiversity offsets, we know about carbon offsets, and as Patrick said, how wrong headed and dangerous they are. But uh, nevertheless, we're now talking about Wall Street has biodiversity offsets and biodiversity um, um, funding. I don't know if you know about the Das Gupta report. He's a senior economist in Great Britain, and he tabled a report that was highly touted. Prince Charles was there, and Attenborough was there, and everybody was there. And basically, uh, Attenborough said, well, it shows that it's going to be economists and not ecologists who save us because and he meant that in a good way. What Das Gupta and others are saying is, don't touch the market economy, it's untouchable. So what we have to do is find a way to protect water and nature within, within that uh, economy. And if you wanna see a very good 
um, critique of the Dasgupta report, I'd send you to um, Green Finance Observatory. It's a, a fine um, uh, institute in, in Europe that's doing really important work. Now at COP26, um, of course, as we know, and Patrick and both Patrick and Richard have alluded to, there was the Glasgow Financial Alliance, which is banks, asset managers, uh, 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 pension insurance funds and so on. And as has been mentioned, they pledged $130 trillion towards uh, nature-based solutions, basically. Um, they want, however, they're very clear that they want the IMF and the World Bank to back them up. They're not putting money into anything that's that's going to lose money. And of course, uh, they'll they'll do this until cor carbon and re reforestation offset offsets start to make money, to make money, because as Patrick has said, they're clearly not in here for any other reason. Um, indigenous groups are understandably deeply concerned about big conservation organizations like Nature Conservancy, which, by the way, is promoting uh, clearly promoting water markets as the solution to the global climate crisis uh, or the water crisis. I mean, in Australia, they separated the water from the land and allow farmers and others to sell their license, uh, to own it and sell it for profit. Um, and of course, it just set off this crazy situation where the, the price of water just went skyrocketed because, of course, the big, in, the big farm, the big ag businesses moved in on the small farmers, then the international investors and so on, and the government totally lost control. But this is something that is being promoted in the name of nature-based solutions, this, this market economy. And in the name of conservation, indigenous peoples, local peoples, people who's whose people have been there for centuries, but maybe don't have title to this land because it's traditional land, are being moved off in the, in the name of biodiversity and nature-based solutions. And we're seeing it in the whole issue of the new, the latest on water futures, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange uh, several months ago has opened up bidding water, water futures uh, in California, basically bidding on drought. So you're no longer buying the actual water, you're buying the water asset and you're bidding, you're betting on the fact that the drought is going to continue to get worse, which I can assure you in California it is. And you just hold on to those assets until um, at such time you can make some, some more profit from them. They have the nerve to, to put this language out and they're, they're going to help conserve water. This is how, how they're going to do this. Um, so it's a, it's a deeply concerning and water gets, water gets, connected and committed into this new system. Nature-based solutions was so, which is, this is a good thing, was so controversial at COP that they left the language out at the end and put in the language of, of, um, of biodiversity um, restoration. Um, so I want us to be very clear, I think when we're talking about um, other aspects of the climate crisis and how, how we, as Patrick has said so repeatedly, we have to cha challenge the fundamental premises of capitalism or we're not going to get out of this. Um, I would give you, I would want to leave you with some hope because I just wrote a book on hope called, it's coming out in March called Still Hopeful Lessons from a Lifetime of Activism. And the signs of hope that I see is that there is some real recognition uh, a real, there's a real fight back happening around the the, the, the profound underlying uh, realities that we're dealing with. And I was really pleased to see Greenpeace International play a very strong role at COP26 on on naming this biodiversity sale, this this you know the marketization of nature, and really beginning to to see within the environmental. Uh, even the big environmental movements are a reality that we can't fight for for one thing without fighting for the other. And I just end by saying that we started a project in Canada about 12 years ago called Blue Communities. We had a right wing government that was saying to municipalities, if you want to upgrade your water infrastructure, if you want federal funding, you have to have a public private partnership. We won't give you money unless it's just exactly what the World Bank did with countries in the global south. You won't get funding from us unless you move to a private corporation. And we've been fighting those, those uh, all over the world. Well, we set this up in Canada. We, we launched a Blue Communities project where a municipality had to pledge to become a Blue Community. It had to pledge to protect and promote water as a human right, to keep it as a public trust, so no privatization, and where there's clean water coming out of the tap, um, to, to ban, uh, phase out bottled water and to promote public 
clean public water in their in their with their public, which just took off like wildfire in Canada. And we were getting municipalities basically saying to the Harper government, we're taking a stand here. It was a positive thing. Then it started to spread to Europe. Um, and, and now uh, other other cities and, and hopefully we're hoping it's going to start to, to move in a different way in the global south. But we now have Paris and Berlin, Los Angeles, um, um, Montreal, Vancouver, a number of major cities have, have declared um, that they're never going to privatize water again, in some cases, Paris and Berlin having both privatized their water. And the good news from all of this is there are about 25 million people now living in uh, blue community cities and municipalities that understand that to protect water you have to keep it in public hands you it doesn't mean they do a good job obviously we know governments often don't but we you the, the worst combination is bad government and big corporations coming in to run this stuff for bad governments we have the right to good government we have the right to demand um access and understanding and democratic oversight of these water sources who's getting access to them what are they doing with it? this must be limited there must be uh, public accountability and you're not going to be able to deal with the water part of the crisis or any part of the crisis unless we have um, de true democratic and, and community control um, and just to say as a, a, a really positive thing because i wrote a book on hope so i'm full, filled with hope that there are now 337 cities in the world, towns and cities in the world, it's being followed by Transnational Institute that tried privatization of their water services, realized it was a terrible mistake and have brought it back under public management. So this is a, a live fight, I call it a, a mighty contest around a, a planet that is, is literally running out of clean water. When we see the stats, it's like the demand is going straight up and the supply is going straight down. We absolutely have to see this as a it's its own crisis within the climate crisis, and we have to keep it in public hands. And I would say it's ongoing. You've got the water trading, you've got bottled water, you've got still got public-private partnerships, you've now got this water speculation. But we have a powerful movement that is saying no to all of this and has really, really um, uh, manifested itself. I mean, here are Canadian municipalities turning down good public good money from the federal government because they were going to hold on to a public water system because their their citizens said so so I, I i want us to be hopeful that we're that we're going to see this thing in its entirety and understand that we can't deal with the climate crisis just by dealing with the carbon issue it has to be the the economy um, moving to a donut economy, understanding the danger of the unlimited growth and, and what it's done mm -hmm. to our planet and to, and to increase the inequality of our people. Well, thank you. I uh, recall when you were telling me about your book, Still Hope, forthcoming book, uh, that I was very encouraged. And it reminded me that the word courage comes from the roots, your heart and telling your story of your age. And to encourage, is what you seem to be doing while being fierce in diagnosis. So I, I'm, I'm grateful. I'm grateful for what, not just what you see, but the way you're teaching us to evolve. You, uh, Richard, you're a new friend. There's two old friends. I'd like to see all of you, how would I say, ask each other questions as you're exploring. But let me just add, I'm seeing something that's hopeful, which is that people can see that this is a problem that's not going away. So the urgency is being recognized. The evasiveness, the refractory nature of a plutocratic political economy, the complications of globalization, and perhaps for the people who were earnest but believed in the market, the pervasiveness of externalities now, meaning this climate is not something that's a commodity. It's something that anybody's action affects us all. So I, I look at all of this and what made me feel a little bit like Nina Simone in singing I Ain't Got No is the fear that if the despair rises, if there isn't progress, it's going to facilitate authoritarian rule ultimately. But Tina, or excuse me, 
Nina Simone comes back in her last verse of that song, and it ain't the name of the book. The song is "Ain't Got No." I got life. I got my arms. I got my hands. I got my fingers. I got my legs. I got my feet. Got my toes. I got my liver. I got my blood. I got life. I got my life. And so you bring life and illumination to this. All these resistances are there. What are the next steps? And I'm gonna I'm gonna let I'm gonna let let's have a free for all here for 15 minutes where you talk to each other and I'll be quiet. Patrick, why don't you start? May, may I start? I, I have questions for both my dear friends. Richard, you watch um, global power politics as well as anyone, and your assessment of the way your arguments move in through UNCTAD reports, but the lobbying you do, the alliances you make, is it going anywhere? Um, or are we in a period, now that the United States is back in the game, ironically perhaps, that that corporate neoliberal uh, influence from U.S. State Department, the kind of people like, who was it, Todd Stern, who said, yeah, we put the carbon up there, but as for recognizing our duty for climate reparations, I just categorically reject that. So I'm asking you for a balance of forces of where specifically your ability to make great arguments is a catching. And then Maud, you really worked, I think better than anyone I've ever met on global movement building, the water warriors. You were here in Johannesburg helping to have a revolt against Suez and, and you're remarkable. And you're in Bolivia and you're really all over this book. I can't wait to see, I hope it documents all this. But you know, for water warriors, maybe for Via Campesino, the, the world peasant movement, excellent global linkages and not just networks, but, but movements were, were built. Why haven't we done that so well with climate? We've had a climate action, a climate justice, two different ways of seeing things. But within climate justice, we haven't really brought in labor yet. We've had all kinds of you know minor disputes and you know distinctions, funders not really being particularly helpful. Can't we do something better now that we desperately need more unity? What do you think? Maud from below and maybe Richard from above? Um, you go first, Richard. I'll start from above. Um, I mean, following up from Rob's musical uh, direction, I mean, I think some famous band said, we can't always get what we want, but if we try sometimes, we just might find we got we get what we need and what we i guess what we need at least from our point of view patrick is you know we need a huge investment push into both adapt we can't solve either the adaptation or the mitigation problem simply by putting a million people on the street i mean this is where i have a certain adverse reaction to the blah 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 um uh, rhetoric because you know transforming the energy system is a huge investment challenge it's a huge investment challenge and there are huge vested interests behind the current energy system which is the source of the problem and 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 we need the state we need states i think the state is the one institution we have for all its faults and for all the problems that i talked about at the beginning we have to make sure that you know public action public investment is is um, captured by a progressive agenda again to be able to make these kind of transformative changes and and that's true i think at the national level and it's certainly true at the multilateral at the multilateral uh, uh, level because you know investments on this scale also need to be coordinated across countries and developing and, and what we've learned from the if we've learned anything from the covid-19 shock we've learned that developing countries are developing countries still despite all the talk that somehow they've all graduated into some higher status because the constraints on their policy the constraints on their fiscal space the, the constraints on their technological uh, upgrading are remain profound and and highly skewed because of the structure of the international division of labor and the governance of international markets by increasingly large um, multi uh, multilateral corporations concentration has been a feature of the hyper globalized world and, and that's and you know and, and this is where you know the frustration i understand comes from but i think building a, a, a positive narrative around the mobilization of public resources for the kind of productive investments in adaptation and and um, mitigation i think is the way in which we have to go in terms of a counter narrative and mobilizing the kind of resources, political and economic, to, to put that narrative into practice. I think that, and I, you know, I, I do I do get slightly frustrated at times by the 
activist community say more i mean we appreciate the energy because in the rest of the cop i mean it's a, it's it's not a it's hardly an exciting uh, place and the, the real energy and the real determination is there but we need that narrative and we need an appreciation of the of the vehicles can, that can make uh, these kinds of changes if we're going to make progress and 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 you know that's that's the focus i think around our work on the global green new deal um, um but it's a challenge it's a real it's a real challenge i think mm -hmm. Well, Patrick, I'd like to send those questions back to you too, because I think you'd have really interesting answers to both of them, and I think we all three want to to to, to speak to this uh, on the on the building a climate justice movement. I think everything's been harder to build um, on the progressive front since 9/11. I don't know if you remember that we were on such a roll. <clears throat> I mean, I've got a, a section in the book called "Chasing the WTO," and I was, you know, all the places that we were at. We were really building. We were really building a, a an international movement that could easily around economic globalization that could easily have 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 been gifted to to the climate movement and all of a sudden the security forces that came down on the world were so intense i was in doha Qatar, for the ministerial there just months after 9 11 and the security was unbelievable I and mean, there were only like a handful of us <clears throat> ngos or protesters whatever allowed in maybe a hundred of us from all over the world and they assigned us to the dumpiest most disgusting hotels that don't deserve the name uh, and and everybody had to pay the same amount but of course the Cuba stayed at the 10 star or whatever um and, and i remember being told by one of the security officials there we did we did really careful things like just put tape over our mouths and, you know we were we were careful we were there was you know careful uh and he said if you did this uh and it wasn't a wto here we, we put you down we put you in you know you'd be you'd be down in a set in, in a prison somewhere uh, and I, I found it was from then on the, co the connection between potential terrorism and our movements got uh, conflated. And it's been a very, very difficult um, for us to, I mean, there was, a, there was a World Bank protest being planned just before 9-11 in Washington. I was going to be there for it. The International Forum of Globalization was going to be there for it. Um, we had a big teaching uh, set up. We had hundreds of thousands of people who were going to be on the street. It's hard to put that, it's hard to do that. Uh, in the same way now. Um, I would say, and I, to Richard's point, I, 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 I think it's very important for us to understand how difficult it's going to be. The reality, and I agree with you around the blah, 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 I think sometimes she said that on day two, and I thought, mm, there's still two weeks. And I, it's not, I, I think the world of Greta Thunberg but, and what she's done, but we also have to understand the, the complications. We've been to India, and I'm, I'm sure all of you have, or other places that are, were laggards, as, as, as Richard said, um, not you said that you said, but pe that people were charging that, that you know, that, and I, I thought that's just patently unfair. And in fact, I thought the Chinese, the head of the Chinese delegation gave a brilliant statement saying, you don't know, you don't even read the stuff we put out. You don't know what we're doing back home. You don't, and we're not doing it for you. We're doing it for our, our people to come in here, right? Whatever we're able to do. But when you go into communities and there's no money and the coal is what you have there, it's going to take a long, it's going to take a long time than we all want. And we have to understand that if we, I really think we have to think about we've got a certain lifestyle in, in mind and we want to exchange fossil fuels for something else. Well, how many solar panels in the desert, probably made in China with coal, how many of those, how many wind, wind, you know, windmills, how many uh, wind farms? I mean, how many, it, it, it's mind boggling what you have to do if we're really going to maintain uh, our current level of, of life. We're in what, people call, Bill William Reese calls, overshoot. And if we don't deal with the overshoot issue, if we don't deal with a system and an economy that's just built on unlimited growth and competition, what we're going to replace one bad thing with another. Like we here in Canada are really worried that the United States is just going to assume 
that all of our mighty rivers are to be dammed so that we can have, and they're already talking about a North American uh, electricity grid. Biden's talking about American jobs, save American jobs, but when they want to talk about electricity, it's a North American electrical grid. And I, that really makes me nervous because I, I worry about that. So I, I really think we have to have a, that, that, that um, deeper conversation. And I would just end, and I, I want to hear from, 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 uh, um, from uh, well, everybody, but from uh, my friend, that it, I, I visited a 99-year-old friend just before she died by Morgan, and she was married to a man, Dr. Griffith Morgan, and he gave a speech when he was 89 at a, a anti-Walmart. They kept Walmart out of their town in Guelph, Ontario for years, and he was on this panel, and he gave this passionate speech and dropped dead right in front of everybody. Um, he gave us his boots on sort of thing. And the next day, the newspaper had a picture of me and Vi and Griff uh, on the front page and a quote from the mayor, now heaven is safe from Walmart, Walmart, which is really um, quite sweet. But anyway, when I visited her, she said to me, she held my hand and she said, have you got a quiet mind? And I said, not particularly. I'm, I'm looking for one. And she said, you'll have a quiet mind when you have faith that there's that others are doing things you don't even know about, you can't even imagine. Or as Rebecca Solnit says, progress isn't an army marching forward. It's a crap scuttling sideways. We don't know how we're going to get there, but we have to have some faith that there's a, a commitment, a human commitment, and, and that has to be fueled by, by wise hope, not false hope, not optimism, so I don't have to do anything, but truly saying to yourself, I'm overwhelmed. When I'm overwhelmed, I have to ask myself, what's the next appropriate step to take? And you take it. Well, in that, in that, I mean, because I think of you as leading our army, you're our vanguard, Maud, you're our heat-seeking missile, and, and you never, you never stray. You're not a scud, you're, you always find the spot. So I'm disappointed now we have to have um, this kind of retreat, because actually it's the tree shakers like you who help the jam makers like Richard. And I guess my question is really, and I ponder it because we never get it right, what's the division of labor so that these fruits that are being shaken by uh, climate justice movement by the youth, um, and hopefully now by labor, trying to figure out what would a just transition require. So what kind of coordination inside, outside, what kind of division of labor, Richard, do we need between Maud and the tree shakers and, and you? And I, I hope there are jam makers, but actually you didn't tell me if there were any. And that's why actually I, I like Greta Thunberg. Her blah, blah, blah reminds the elites that they're not jam makers, right? Or they're just not interested and they need delegitimization. We actually need to clear them out. I'm very much into the blah, 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 Richard. I apologize. Present company accepted. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, it is what we think about a lot, including in Unkhand. I mean, you know, the, the moment, our moment of triumph, right, was of course the effort to establish a new international economic order in the 1970s uh, that you know UNCTAD was the, the the kind of substantive backing for that and 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 developing countries were very much uh it, it politically motivated to move that in in that direction and they, there was a level of solidarity amongst developing countries at that point that that in fact uh, move things in a in a direction where there was a lot of hope i think more at that point amongst developing countries and economic circumstances were in the favor the advanced economies um were were in a certain amount of disarray coming out of the of the weakening of the golden age that you know and distribution struggles within the advanced economies uh, empowered to some extent developing we know and we know what happened right i mean we know that that alliance within the south eventually um, uh, collapsed in the face of uh, pressures from the advanced economies. Uh, I, you know, I think, and, and 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 we're a long way. We don't have that kind of solidarity in the developing world right now. That's I, I wish it was true, but you know, from an institution that was set up on the back of that, we don't. It doesn't exist at the moment. And I think the you know the challenge then is to find what combination of uh, a countervailing. Uh, forces can be put together in a progressive direction and clearly one of the things that we need to do as as because we look at it from a country perspective is to bring in um the the role of organized labor and and to some extent i'm current in current even though labor is much weaker today than it was in the 70s you know there are parts of the labor movement that have clearly embraced 
the the notion of a just transition and the and the possibilities that that does to marrying the issues around economic injustice with 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 uh, repairing the the planet and so i mean there are i think there are real positives to be taken from that uh, the, the role of civil society as you you know as you embrace it patrick is part of the energizing alliance that we need of that there's there's, there's no doubt so i mean so, i mean there are you know it's, it is very much you know gramsci's uh, uh pessimism of the mind optimism of the will i think but there are signs i think and and our work on the global green new deal certainly suggests that that there are elements of the necessary alliance there that, that the jam makers if you like in your language patrick that, that that we just need to kind of find ways of of scaling up and 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 one of the ways that we think we need to do one of the ways to do that is to provide a very strong counter narrative to the neoliberal agenda which re remains powerful i mean incredibly powerful and 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 so you know strengthening that narrative emphasizing the importance of public investment public services uh public goods as the as the basis for an alternative sort of agenda i think i think is the way at least that we have some element of hope in in terms of moving forward and we did have just the last point a very great victory even maud when you were in that sleazy hotel in doha the tree shakers had forced the jam makers to put an exemption uh, on intellectual property for aids medicines that meant instead of costing a hundred thousand or ten thousand dollars a year they're free and seven million of my compatriots get it and we've actually raised life expectancy from 52 uh, in 2005 to 65 just before covid Richard, that's the kind of merit good, right? The public good strategy. And there there was that that alliance of really robust activists on the streets, ACT UP in the US and Treatment Action Campaign and Medicine Sans Frontier, Oxfam. And maybe Rob, that's why we're so grateful that INET is helping a, a Polanyian, not just Gramscian, but a Polanyian double movement by working against the logic, the logic above the movement of neoliberalism and the market. And now um, with all of your uh, great work and Rob, thanks so much for putting this together and all the things you do, moving the anti-neoliberal project. Where are we going with that, Rob? You should have the last word. All right. Um, well, I'll fuse this with a question that appeared on the board. A gentleman said, I would love an elaboration of Rob's statement if there's no progress that could facilitate more authoritarianism. Prior to seeing that, I was preparing to share with you what I think is very important medicine. And I will read you four quotes. The proposal of any new law or regulation of commerce that arises from the merchant class, therefore, ought always to be listened to with great precaution. Second quote, civil government, so far it is instituted for the security of property, is in reality instituted for the defense of the rich against the poor or of those who have some property against those who have none at all. Third, avarice and injustice are always short-sighted. And finally, the government and an exclusive company of merchants is perhaps the worst of all governments for any country whatsoever. Whatever, excuse me, not whatsoever. Now, where did those four quotes come from? They came um, from this Scottish man Adam Smith. that people who believe in markets talk about named Adam Smith from the book called The Wealth of Nations. It's hiding in plain sight. Now, when my the person raising the question about authoritarian rule, we are taught that capitalism receives its moral groundedness from being embedded in a democracy. When we commodify social design and enforcement, when the scrutiny in the media is driven by the imperatives of advertisers, when universities become dependent on money and can't teach people other than what you might call credentials, we're in a very dangerous zone. There's a wonderful old book by a man, uh, I think his name Gerald Jampolsky, called Love is Letting Go of Fear. I think this question that's asked about authoritarianism is that if you can't feel the legitimacy of governance, if you are despairing for perhaps the end of life for your descendants, when you get that afraid, 
you resort to alternatives that are not healthy, but you don't see any place at the end of the road. What Adam Smith showed is now at a time where, as Marvin Gaye used to sing, what's going on? What's going on? Well, we can kind of see what's going on. And what Marvin Gaye's third verse says is, we got to find a way to bring some understanding here today. That's what INET's trying to do. That's why I asked the three of you to join me. I thought you brought some understanding here today. I, I think you bring some understanding to all kinds of dimensions of life. And how do I say, there's another song, when you're going to wake up, when you're going to wake up and strengthen the things that remain. We're getting our wake up call right now, whether it's the pandemic, whether it's climate, and you people are rising to the challenge. Thank you for joining me. And uh, somebody's one other question. I was thinking about COP27 in Egypt, which is going to make it very hard for civil society to express itself on site. Are you concerned about that as well? Each of you, final thoughts. Well, I'll just start with not answering that, but just correcting mm -hmm. myself, because I think the world of Greta Thunberg. So I just want to make sure that I'm not um, in any way suggesting that the movement, particularly the movement of young people, isn't fabulous and must stay and must grow. Um, I think my concern is that we, we hold on to a vision a lifestyle, a, a particular lifestyle, and think that we can exchange. It, it's there's a if there's a criticism of the youth climate move, movement from me, it's that I find it very centered on carbon, and somehow the replacements are there, and it's just a lack of will. And I I think it's really complicated, and it's that it's that place between complication and I was encouraged at COP26, because I heard people up on the podium who were in power who said things I've never heard them say before. And I just want to say, I don't think the world has ever, ever, ever been more ready to take action. With the information we have, with the scientific knowledge we have, with the communication we have, we have to move forward. And that's our sign. And it includes powerful um, youth um, movements. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah, just, on Egypt, just on Egypt, very quick. I mean, I, th I mean, you know, developing countries are phenomenally frustrated with the way in which the multilateral system operates. I, I, and, and, but positively, I think the good thing is that, the, and they've been frustrated for some time, but they're moving from frustration and a, fa a fairly reactive politics to, tr to trying to fashion a more positive agenda. I think across a number of issues, of which the waiver that Patrick talked about, I think, is a is one indication of of that movement from a kind of reactive to a more constructive agenda. And and I think actually Egypt, the fact that it's being hosted in a developing country, may well you know be a catalyst for that kind of thinking. Because I think I'm hoping that developing countries will be empowered by the fact that it is in a developing country and, and that, that, in a sense, this is their terrain and they know the problems better than anybody else because they're, they're on the front line of these problems. Yeah, yeah. Patrick? Well, I uh, dispute a little bit that we should pay that much attention to the COP27. It's going to be actually in Sharm El Sheikh, a ridiculous resort. And indeed, because um, I know because Pan-African Climate Justice Alliance is figuring out how its members in Egypt and how we're going to have a meeting there in a couple of weeks, how we actually prepare for this 11 month uh, rolling out of, of pressure to, if there is anybody inside to help fight the imperialists, well, we're there with them. But I think because that's very unlikely because CC is a, is a dictator um, and he's very much in, in league with the West. What we will see is a thousand Sharm El Sheikhs all over uh, the world, and they'll be more and more tough. And hopefully they go to embassies and consulates and, and really show who the uh, climate criminals are. But they're also engaged in blockadia. And I think that's why I'll, I'll just teach you those last two words. I'm sure I'm sure Maud remembers them because we say power to the people. Amandla, away to. And I think that's the only way forward. Amandla, away to. Thanks there. Well, 
I guess uh, to finish the day, maybe Mick Jagger's grinning because he heard him song. You can't always get what you want. But I went to Philadelphia and I picked up a song called Ain't No Stopping Us Now. We're on the move. We got to groove. And it's people like you that create it. Thank you all. I look forward to following your work and the light you shed on everything so that we can't be stopped.